Good afternoon, and thanks for joining Washington, D.C.-based Center for Shouts and Associates in our Get far Sighted in 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR, or Federal Acquisition Regulations, is the rulebook that the federal government must follow when making purchases. Our webinar pulls from contracting experts to explain each part of the FAR. It is complimentary and recorded. We will post all of the recordings on our website and YouTube channel, where we have over 300 government contracting webinars available for download. A special thanks to our webinar partner in this series, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please visit their website to learn more about the organization. We would also like to thank our friends at Open the FAR for their sponsorship. If your organization is interested in sponsoring the series or one part, please contact hello at jennifershouse.com. And now a little bit about us. We work with primarily large businesses to help them navigate the federal marketplace. We work with both product and service companies as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include publicly traded organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle assistance, and more. All of our services can also be built into a training course for your team. Learn more about us on our website. And we would like to let you know about some ways to reach government and government contractors through us. We offer advertising and sponsorship opportunities through our weekly newsletter and also in our webinar series. For pricing or to place an order, please email us at hello at jennifershouse.com. Now let's move on to learn a little bit about today's speaker, Tony Anakeef. You can find his contact information here. And today we are covering FAR Part 38 with speaker with Tony. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We're thankful for your participation in the series. The floor is now yours. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, the invitation from Jennifer and her colleagues uh, in inviting us to uh, talk about um, this topic of FAR Part 38. Um, I have the privilege of running the government contracts practice with one of my colleagues at uh, Williams Mullen, and we have the privilege of uh, working with domestic and international small and large companies to do two things. One, to help grow their business, and two, help them preserve uh, the assets that they've developed uh, over the years. Um, but I think we'll find today is that this is a useful, uh, useful area, and if we could go to the next page, please. Our agenda today is pretty straightforward. We're going to uh, have a nice uh, socially distanced drive through the federal supply schedule landscape in terms of its context, uh, how to get involved, and how to get something out of the process. Uh, if after the program you have questions, my contact information will be at the end, and I'm happy to uh, answer questions. Next slide, please. So. What is FAR Part 38 all about? Um, you know, when Jennifer asked me to uh, speak on FAR Part 38, I, I thought it was a great idea, especially considering that FAR Part 38 may be the shortest part in the FAR. It has all of three sections and runs to about two pages, so I thought that this might make for a very nice short program on a Friday afternoon. But as we'll see, um, FAR Part 38 uh, really opens up and is a gateway to the GSA and VA federal supply schedules. Um, and they lead to a variety of topics that we're going to discuss today, uh, how, how the whole process works and what one might uh, get out of it. But essentially, Part 38 uh, sets up the authority for the federal government to operate a federal supply schedule system uh, directs that it'll be run by the GSA, uh, which manages the FSS. GSA also has the authority to delegate its authority, which it has done to the VA for medical supplies and services. And then separately, the Department of Defense has a similar schedule system for military systems that's outside the FSS program uh, and is really outside our topic today. So why don't we dive in with the next slide? What is an FSS program, um, which some of you may know of as a GSA schedules program or a multiple award or mass program? Um, you know, conceptually, really what these programs are is a system to provide agencies with simplified processes um, that are different from those standalone procurements that one finds on FedBizOps that allows these agencies to buy commercial supplies and services and buy commercial, which you can find in FAR Part 2.101's definition, it's the stuff that companies are selling in the marketplace today. So if 
if we're talking about that kind of thing, uh, and it covers a huge swath of supplies and services, it's probably something that would fit within a GSA schedule. Um, and it allows you to buy them in varying quantities at volume discounts. Um, the GSA implements that through long-term uh, indefinite delivery contracts that are awarded by competitive procedures. Those contracts run for 20 years in five-year increments, so they're long-term. Um, they are for companies offer to provide supplies and services at, at stated prices. Um, you actually publish your prices, and you can go see the prices of your competitors. You agree to provide those prices for a given period of time, and you get to decide where you're going to deliver them. So some companies might want to deliver their products within the United States, others are willing to do it internationally, and some only offer their products overseas. Next slide, please. So what is the GSA uh, multiple award system? Um, it fits within the concept that we just talked about. Um, it's long-term government contracts with commercial companies, and it offers millions of sales opportunities for commercial products and services. To, to give you some idea, um, the government buys about $30 billion of goods and services off of the supply schedules uh, every year. And that is from the smallest of companies to the largest of companies. Um, so it is a tremendous marketplace. And the government has now created 12 major uh, MAS categories of products and services and hundreds of subcontract subcategories, which is what we'll now look at on the next page. So if you went to the GSA schedules webpage, oh, four or five years ago, you would find that there was a list of scores and scores of numbered schedules that were the source of providing different goods and services, furniture, uh, fire services, IT services, accounting services, and one had to work their way uh, through them to find the most convenient um, one that would best serve your products to sell to the government. A few years ago, the government decided to consolidate everything into a single Schedule 99, Multiple Award Schedule 99, and what it has is 12 large categories into which have been placed all of the former schedules. Now, each of these broad categories may have any number of subcategories that one could drill down. So if one is looking at the professional services category and on the GSA webpage, one went there, one would see that there are uh, subcategories for business administration, legal, environmental, logistics, translation services, and technology services and the like. If you go to info technology, there's a host of all the kind of information technology, cloud hosting, technical advice, and all that kind of uh, information. So that is where one begins the process of, of uh, looking at how to proceed. So let's look at the next page and, and see how the process works and, and why it's so attractive to the government. You know, the fact is that a buyer wants certainty. And one of the things about a GSA schedule contract is that all the prices are pre-negotiated and they're all determined to be fair and reasonable. So a buyer who wants to go buy a product doesn't have to engage if it doesn't want to in additional negotiations. It already knows that the marketplace um, has created prices that are fair and reasonable for the particular service or product that one's going to buy. The other thing a buyer knows is that the contracts have been awarded pursuant to a standard scheme that ensures compliance with the law. So in this case, they've been negotiated and are subject to FAR Part 12, which are the commercial item terms and conditions um, that the government negotiates with companies that operate in the marketplace because they're somewhat more business friendly than some of the more uh, onerous uh, um, FAR provisions that apply to non-commercial items. The other thing is that the government has made a determination under FAR Part 9 that everybody on a GSA schedule is deemed to be responsible. So that's yet another bit of analysis that doesn't need to be uh, gone through. 
So th the other thing is that the governing principles are pretty easy on how to conduct a procurement. FAR Part 38, which I've said has already got just three sections, um, is really all policy. Subpart 8.4, which we're going to talk about, are the ordering procedures. And we're going to find that those ordering procedures are fairly simple both for the government buyer and companies that are selling their products. Um, the only complicating factor is the GSA Administrative Acquisition Manual that puts in some policies and procedures that the government needs to follow. Um, but because it's a manual and not regulations, those are not things that are binding on the government. They just help to smooth the process. Let's turn the page. Now, the focus of today's talk is on the GSA schedule, but I, I wanted to spend just a moment and touch on the VA schedules because they were delegated to the VA by the GSA. Um, I've given you the sites to go get the information on them. The thing to remember is that pretty much everything we're talking about with regard to the GSA is going to apply to the VA as well. The difference is, and rather than having a GSA schedule that, or additional GSA schedules that cover medical products and services, the VA has set up its own nine categories. And lest one think that this is a niche area, they have at currently over 1,700 contracts and did $14 billion worth of business last year. Next page, please. So, you know, why would one seek a GSA uh, schedule contract? That is probably one of the most common questions that we receive from companies that are thinking about getting into the government. They hear about a GSA schedule contract and they say, gee, that might be a, a great way to get in. And in our discussions with them, we note that GSA schedule contracts really are only one arrow in the quiver of opportunities for doing business with the government. You know, there's subcontracting opportunities. One can jump in all the way and try and go after a specific contract as a prime contractor. There are these large uh, government-wide area contracts and you could become a subcontractor or a participant there. And in recent years, there has been the expansion of something called other transaction agreement authority. Um, which really aren't government contracts, but have become quite the fashion for government handling prototype and research and development projects. And one could become a member of a consortium uh, serving a particular government need, or one could become a subcontractor to a consortium. That is the subject of a separate webinar that Jennifer Schaus gives and on which we talk quite frequently. So, Although the, there are a number of things to consider before you get involved, uh, many companies have found that the GSA schedule is a, is a great route, and, and these are some of the reasons why. Uh, we've already talked about that it's a $30 billion market, so it's a vast market open to a huge array of buyers. There are hundreds of thousands of government contractors, which means there's a lot of competition, but a lot of business to hand out. When you become a government contractor under the GSA schedule, you enter into what you know you might call the Macy's catalog for the government. It's called GSA Advantage. And your products are added to a computer database that's searchable, and someone searching for your particular service or your widget or your IT product may come across it, um, or through marketing, you may find a quick way to sell it. The barriers to entry are not that high. Um, as we'll talk about in a few moments. It's certainly a speedier sales process. If you think most government contracts take months to go through the process of issuing a synopsis, uh, issuing a solicitation, receiving offers, evaluating offers, negotiating a price and awarding, here you've got a process where most of that work's been done and depending on the size of the uh, procurement, um, they can be awarded fairly quickly uh, and painlessly, um, given that the prices are already done and really what you're looking for is, is the best product to meet your needs. But from the, from the seller's point of view, you know, they're commercial-like terms. I'm, I'm not going to say that the FAR uh, exactly follows what we do in standard commercial contracts, but it's like that. And it dates back to the 90s when the government was trying to bring back 
uh, or bring in commercial firms into the business. So the process is a little easier. The terms are a little light. Um, and associated with that, the compliance burden is a little bit lighter. Um, many of the audit requirements that one sees on more traditional heavyweight contracts are a lot lighter here. One's often dealing with fixed price contracts and the government's right to audit really is a lot less. Um, we'll talk about the compliance burdens towards the end. The other thing is it opens up all sorts of new opportunities. This is a way to get your foot in the door with an agency. And we often explain that get inside the, the tent however you can, because once you're there in discussing things with your customer, you learn things that generally aren't on the street and you may get business. One of the great ways to get new opportunities is something called the GSA contractor teaming agreements. This is not the standard small business teaming agreements or some of the others you do. This is a program under the GSA schedule program where two holders of GSA schedules can combine to submit a proposal together or, or, or more than two to submit a proposal to provide a full solution to a government need. Each of the GSA schedule holders remains a prime contractor, although it picks one of the of one of the two or three to be sort of the lead administrator. And then what they do is they divvy up the fees that come in. It is a great way and a simple way to uh, expand one's business. In fact, one of the nice things is that the CTA teaming agreement, there's a template online which really doesn't need to be uh, modified that much to make it a working document. One can, of course, as one grows as a business, one can supplement one's offerings um, uh, and add them to one's schedule. Um, if you're a small business, um, although there are no, quote, set-aside contracts under the GSA schedules, contracting officers and agencies, when they're conducting procurements, could decide to limit their search to small businesses and reserve those efforts for those businesses. So it's an opportunity. Um, it's certainly something that uh, um, a small business can market when they're going to see an agency because the agency, if they do award a scheduled contract to a small business, get to tally that up as a small business credit. The last point on this page um, is the caveat, which we will come back to. Um, money doesn't fall from trees and nor do contracts. So a GSA schedule contract is really nothing more than a hunting license and one has to pay attention to that when one goes into the process. Let's move to the next slide and see how we go about getting a GSA schedule. I think the key point here is that the way GSA has set this up is it's really a set of standard processes and it's aimed at self-service. So there are a lot of consultants and lawyers out there who are hawking their skills at how they'll get you on a GSA schedule and how they're, you know, absolutely essential. Um, while we on occasion advise companies uh, with regard to GSA schedules, the whole system is set up that uh, unless you're a complicated company with a difficult sales network, this is something that a business person uh, with some sophistication can do themselves and with some effort. Um, so it's not essential uh, to hire a consultant or a lawyer. Um, one of the things that we explain is, or ask, is who knows more about your business? Uh, me, the lawyer, or you, the CEO? And the fact is that it, in, it requires the involvement of senior management, uh, a business commitment and a time commitment in order to succeed. What lawyers and consultants can do is that we tend to have familiarity with the process. Um, we happen to have seen a number of these proposals that have gone in and we've helped companies go through the process. So we can do things like red teaming. We can help with compliance issues, which are critical uh, once one gets uh, on, the uh, on the schedule. One can help in dealing with things like small business subcontracting plans. But one should really think about being involved in the process from the outset. So what are the initial questions that you should ask? You know, the first is, what do you offer? If you offer sort of a single tiny service or product, 
uh, is this really something that you want to sell to the government? And is the government going to buy it? Because as we're going to see, you have to sell a certain amount of product or service each year in order to stay on, stay on the schedule. Second, do you qualify? Are you a brand new business? Because GSA generally requires you to have been in business for two years, with some exception. Sometimes you can do it after one in order to qualify. And that's just so that you have been in business and have operated for a while to see if you're going to be a going concern. Are you willing to make the time investment? Both, and, and one of the great tests is, are you willing to put time into developing your proposal? Um, any number of times people will call us up and say, well, why don't you draft it? All of our proposal for us, and of course, we don't know that much about the company. We can interview you. And in fact, we're helping a company in that regard do that. But it's really most successful if from the outset, senior management gets involved in developing the proposal. And then after you get the award, uh, helping to market uh, your product or service to the government. The fourth question is, uh, can you deliver? You know, the government is a big, is a big, big customer, largest in the world. And sometimes their requests can be significant. So it's important to tailor what the maximum order that you'll be able to deliver on and where you deliver it. Can you deliver anywhere in the United States or can you deliver overseas? So assuming you go through all of that and you decide you still want to do it, there are some procedural things that one needs to do. Um, one has to register one's company. Uh, one does that through DUNS. Um, if you go onto the Beta SAM website um, or SAM Beta website, that's going to take you through the process. Um, it's going to get you registered as a government contractor in SAM. It is going to show you where to go in the DUNS system to get a, basically a government contract number. And then it's going to take you to a third party to get a digital certificate. The digital certificate is something that a senior member of the company needs to acquire um, because unlike years ago when proposals were submitted in paper by email, now the entire process is done through an e-file system. And only a person with a digital certificate can enter the data into the system and to have it considered. Um, then one identifies the MAS schedule or the FSS schedule. And I use the word evergreen because they're on FedBizOps. They're also, uh, you can get the link to them off the GSA website. And by the way, when I say the GSA website, if you Google uh, GSA schedule contracts, that will take you to a page which um, gives you really a lot of this information. But the link we've given to you um, will help you find your GSA schedule. The reason it's evergreen, it's always there. The critical thing to keep in mind is that you must be using the current edition of the schedule that is in effect on the date that you submit your proposal. And the reason that's important is that these schedules get updated periodically. And by that, I mean as often as monthly. Currently, all of the schedules are going through a refresh to add a, a FAR provision that implements Section 899 of the National Defense Authorization Act. That provision requires or bars contractors from using in their services or products certain prohibited Chinese IT products from Huawei and the like. And all of these mass schedules are being updated. If you submit a proposal under an outdated uh, solicitation, it'll be rejected and you'll have to go through the process again. The next thing you have to do seems almost silly, but you have to do it. There are two training classes that again, the senior negotiators are gonna have to take. They're online video programs. They really explain the process that uh, uh, the GSA schedules are about and they, help you come up with ideas. Um, and the reason it's important is that as part of your solicitation process, you must check off the box that you've taken these classes. Now, there are those who might say, oh, I'll just check off the box. Remember that a solicitation to the federal government, uh, excuse me, an offer submitted to the federal government is submitted pursuant to 18 U.S. Code 1001. 
to check off a box that says you've taken training when you haven't would be a criminal violation. So it's, uh, it's several hours of time that you need to invest um, as you go into the process and before you click the submit button. Speaking of clicking the submit button, let's go to the next page. All right, so once you have this product and you get your solicitation, you need to complete it. Now, I told you that there were 12 categories and scores and scores of subcategories, but pretty much all of the solicitations require that you answer a series of questions that are really presented in a questionnaire format. Um, there's some exceptions, but this generally covers pretty much everything. You're gonna be asked about your technology or your service. What is it that you're selling? And this is your opportunity to describe whatever it is and why it's the greatest. The second thing you need to provide is past performance. You need to provide three examples of past performance. So if you've done government contracts before, um, and you've received what's called a CPARS rating, you can use that. Um, if you haven't, if this is your entree into government contracts, then you need to provide data <laughs> and contact information for three entities that you've done business for in the past. And you fill out a questionnaire, it's gonna be sent to your contacts and they'll provide it. The next thing they want is they wanna see some experience. This is an opportunity for you to show off. Pick one or two of your projects and show, excuse me, why it pertains to and shows why you're good at what you're selling. Um, in the schedule contracts, um, you'll see that they are broken out into standard industry nomenclature, SIN numbers. And you might actually offer a different number of categories under different SINs within your offering or product offering you're allowed to provide a description as to each of these sins and explain why you're good. You need to talk about how you provide quality control. Um, you know, the government really relies on contractors and holds them to a standard that's maybe a little higher than it holds for itself. Um, so you have to tell them how you're gonna make sure the products or services are good. You have to identify your negotiators. That's gonna be the person that negotiates price uh, and answers questions that the government may submit. Uh, this is where sometimes lawyers and consultants come in. Um, if you're using a consultant or a lawyer to assist you uh, in putting together the proposal, you can provide a authorization letter that grants authority to your consultant to certain amounts of access to the government, i.e. answer questions, allowed to submit information, you can allow them to negotiate price, although we think this is something that you should reserve to yourself, but you should think who your negotiators are gonna be, and you should identify two. When the government calls, it expects a prompt response, and if one person is out of pocket, it's always good to have a backup. Um, there's something that is required uh, in addition, which is the, uh, your sales practice, and how do you go about selling? Um, it doesn't need to be detailed, but how do you go about selling your product? And you need kind of a general description out of your employee manual how you compensate. So the key part of all of this, of course, is your price. If you're in the marketplace, you probably have a price list and you sell to various entities around the United States. When you get involved with a GSA schedule, the government is going to seek what is essentially your most favored nation clause pricing they're going to want you to pick a base price, which becomes your sort of set price that you sell your service or product to in the marketplace, and they will negotiate off of that. So you can have a range of prices for different products and different terms. What you're trying to avoid is once you get awarded a schedule contract, you have to maintain that price. And if you don't, if you offer Uncle Joe, or your college roommate's business, a flash 10% discount out of the blue, when the government comes to audit you up to three years later, they can reduce all of your pricing by the amount of that discount if you can't justify what you did. So it's, that is really the critical thing to consider when you put together your price sheet. 
Um, I said that there are various subcategories under the category headings. In addition to these general questions, um, you know, there are specific sections and requirements that if you're providing fire services or certain IT requirement or maybe some language services or accounting services that you may have to provide. You also have to respond to representations and certifications. And uh, I've, I've talked about the negotiators before. So you put that package together, um, you then have to e-file it. One of the things that you can do is you can write all of the stuff out on paper. Uh, then you can go into e-file and you can cut and paste into the boxes that are there. Once that's done, you'll get a notification that it's been accepted. And at some point, uh, if you haven't messed up anything and it gets rejected on sort of procedural grounds, you'll get notified that your proposal is being evaluated. It will be evaluated preliminarily to see if it sort of checks the boxes and there's anything missing. If it is, it'll be sent back. Um, then there'll be a substantive evaluation. If, if if the agency or the evaluator has questions about what you're offering, you'll receive a question. Um, and that's when it's sometimes useful, if you're gonna use a consultant or lawyer, to have them as an authorized communicator. Because while it may take a while, like months, for the, the GSA to go through this process, when they send you a question, they expect a response within a day or two. And the failure to address it may mean that your proposal drops to the bottom of the pile. Once you get through the evaluation, which by the way includes technical and past performance, it also, if you're not a small business, will look at your small business subcontracting plan. Um, those of you that have been around the government space know that uh, the government engages in a little social engineering. It requires large companies to make provision to include small businesses as subcontractors. So one has to come up with a subcontracting plan of how it'll perform some of its work with subcontractors. Um, then you get a call from the contracting office who will engage in price negotiations. One does not need to grant additional discounts to the government um, uh, in a GSA schedule, uh, particularly at this point. Um, you can stick with your prices or you can award some kind of different terms. Or you can adjust your warranty terms. There are a number of things you can do, but that's when the government does its bargaining to see what it can get. And again, it's, it's in theory offering you a big market and it's therefore asking for a discount. Once you do that and once the contract is awarded, you have to post your prices. Um, you know, many folks think, well, their prices are secret, but in the GSA world, they're published and you actually put on your website for your company that you're a GSA schedule holder. You might publish your prices, but you have to upload them into GSA Advantage and you have to send hard copies to various places. Um, one of the things you can do when you're researching whether to become involved in a GSA schedule effort is you can go see what your competitors are offering. Um, so that you can get a lay of the land and see if your prices are in line with what they offer. Um, there's general information about all of this at the, uh, the website that we've provided. And uh, um, hopefully the process will work well. Um, you should plan on this taking several months. It certainly takes a few weeks to go through the proposal process and get it done. Um, depending on the schedule, you know, it used to be the IT schedule took up to a year, some were a couple of months. So build in a little lead time for this to go through the process. Let's go to the next page. So <clears throat> the nice thing is you've, uh, you've gotten your schedule and, uh, you know, how's it going to work? Um, you've gone and you put it on GSA Advantage. Um, I also explained that, you know, money and contracts don't fall from trees, so you've got to go market. But for, it's always good to look at the other side. What is the, what's the government doing? So buyers um, or the contracting personnel receive requests from their users, the, you know, the IT people, the doctors, uh, the pilots, the ship drivers. Um, they have needs and the buyers are required to go do market research and determine what is the most effective way for them to secure their products or services that they need. 
and pretty much everybody in the government, the DOD is a little reticent, but pretty much everybody in the government recognizes that using a GSA schedule is a good vehicle and means to acquire goods, and they're encouraged to do so. So once the government decides that it's going to use the GSA schedule, it goes to Section 8.4, which really establishes the ordering procedures that the government must use in order to acquire a product. And it's useful for you as a buyer to understand the process so that you'll know what happens uh, when you get contacted by the government. So orders fall into two categories. First are supplies and services that are offered at a fixed price that do not require a statement of work. So uh, you want to buy a laptop or you want to rent a car or you want to buy uh, uh, tree felling services uh, or, or the like. You don't need a statement of work for that. You, you kind of, like you go on Amazon, um, you go want to look at a picture and a description and you want to buy it. And you want to buy it at a fixed price. So that's one category. The second category, and, and by the way, it includes services. So one could offer, um, you know, uh, uh, Excel spreadsheet training classes. And one could offer a class for 30 people once a week for four weeks for a fixed price. That's how services get brought in. Um, the second category is services requiring a statement of work. And that's where things are a little more complicated. You know, IT enterprise services, uh, certain healthcare services, HR services, where you may be doing it on a fixed price basis, but on the other hand, you might be doing it on a time and materials basis where there is some kind of ongoing effort and you really can't put a box around um, everything. So let's get more into the details at the next slide, please. So um, as on the, on the prior page, you saw that there were uh, two different citations. Um, FAR 8.405-1 covers the fixed price without an SOW, and FAR 8.405-2 covers um, uh, uh, services where you need an SOW. So they're a little bit different, but for the most part, how they proceed um, are, are they're similar um, with the distinction being value-based. So there can be orders less than the micro-purchase level, orders between the micro-purchase level and the simplified acquisition level, and orders above the simplified acquisition level. And so what I've done here is really cluster the similarities. Um, there, are, there are, you know, little differences that occur between the two categories, but these are the similarities um, that one as a business person would want to know about. So if the government's trying to buy something at the micro-purchase level, a couple of laptops, um, they really can go into a schedule and they can award a contract or buy with a credit card whatever they need um, from any company that meets the minimum. And that applies both to widgets and services, regardless of whether you need a statement of work. At, at that level, uh, services often don't have much of a statement of work, but um, it applies to both. So the next category is orders exceeding the $3,500 level, but less than the simplified acquisition threshold. So, you know, it used to be that the simplified acquisition level used to be 100,000 and it got raised to 150,000. Well, that doesn't necessarily buy that much, um, but then Congress added a whole host of other exceptions. And those apply to contingency operations, responding to cyber, nuclear, radiological, terrorism, natural disasters. If a contract is being sought in that type of an environment, you have a much higher uh, simplified acquisition threshold of $750,000 if it's in the United States, that's continental United States, and 1.5 million outside the United States. And then there's a third category. If you're providing humanitarian aid anywhere in the US or otherwise, you have a $300,000 level. So um, these orders can become kind of significant. The process 
here. I've broken out both for the, the non-SOW situation and the SOW situation. It's, it's pretty similar. For the non-SOW, contractor go, officer goes and looks at the multiple award schedule. It selects three vendors. It can select more, but it can select three vendors, and it, it awards on the basis of best value. I'll talk about best value in a minute. If there's a need for a statement of work, the contracting officer has to issue a request for quotations, and the RFQ has to contain a statement of work and the evaluation criteria that will be used to evaluate. It has to be sent to at least three vendors, either by putting it on eBuy or another vehicle or, or sending it out to three. There are, there are a number of protests out there when uh, an incumbent contractor suddenly finds that a contract, scheduled contract's been awarded to somebody else and they weren't invited to the table. That unfortunately, uh, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, if you don't do a good job on a scheduled contract, you face the possibility that the agency may just not include you the next time around. The other thing they have to do is specify the type of the order. Uh, fixed price or labor hour with a preference for firm fixed price. Um, I mentioned best value. It's going to be important on this third category. So why don't we turn to the next page? <coughs> and those are the orders above the simplified acquisition threshold. I said at the beginning that when you're going to go after a GSA schedule, are you going to be able to deliver? Um, the government is big and its needs can be substantial. So you need to be able to deliver your product or service um, as needed. Every scheduled contract will have a maximum order value and you can try and adjust that, but they're there. And there's also a minimum value, uh, which is really uh, inconsequential. Uh, if it didn't, it wouldn't be a valid contract. So there's always a minimum and a, uh, a maximum value. So if you've got one of these, so this could be a million dollar type of, of uh, order if that's what's authorized, or it could be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you're buying a, uh, a fixed price, uh, non-statement of work uh, product that's large, you still need uh, an RFQ now. You have to describe what you want, obviously, or your services. Um, it doesn't necessarily constitute a statement of work, but when you're getting into a large uh, procurement, you obviously want something that describes the service so that people will know what it is that is being sought. The other thing you're supposed to do is you're supposed to post it on eBuy or make wide distribution uh, such that you're likely to receive three orders. If you don't, excuse me, three offers. If you don't receive three offers, you have to justify proceeding with the procurement or go and redo it. The idea here is that the government is trying to secure um, a significant number of offers so that they can evaluate the uh, process. The RFQ, of course, is required to include the evaluation criteria, um, and that will include probably technical and price considerations. And that's what the award is based on. Again, if you're in services, um, you need a statement of work, evaluation criteria, same distribution, wide distribution. Um, all quotes have to be fairly considered. That, that applies to all of them, obviously, whether it's under this, um, whether it's under a statement of work or non-statement of work, and you award per the RFQ's evaluation criteria. Best value. Um, best value is often the criteria that is used, and that's really a trade-off uh, that involves the consideration of your technical proposal, uh, if it also involves management considerations, quality control considerations, past performance considerations, small business subcontracting plan. All of that's added up and evaluated and scored, and then your price is considered and then you trade off because you might have a situation where a higher price but technically superior offer is something the government wants to buy um, as opposed to always going with the lowest priced offer. So that's an analysis that you have to go forward. Um, the order is awarded. 
And then it's important to know that although uh, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts in other agencies are, are barred from the GAO and Court of Federal Claims protest process, uh, task order awards under a GSA contract can be protested. Um, and are. So they are not subject to the $10 million exception uh, that applies to other IDIQ contracts. So um, the other thing I wanted to uh, note before we move on here, once, once this award is made and you are doing business with the government, a government agency who decides or which decides that it really likes what you're going to do uh, or the products you're delivering, and it decides that it's going to have an ongoing need uh, on a continuing basis, um, it can ask you to enter into a basic purchasing agreement underneath your task order. That is a separate agreement of terms and conditions that allows you to rapidly provide goods and services on somewhat more beneficial terms. What that really means is the government and you will negotiate some sort of price reduction or more favorable terms, warranty or delivery terms uh, than you have offered in your schedule contract. It's a private deal and it does not affect uh, your other task order contracts or any other contracts you may have in the government. Uh, it's a nice thing to lock up some continuing business and it's something that a number of contractors have found to be worthwhile. So let's go on to the next page and see what happens after you win an award. I said that it's a hunting license, and I said at the beginning it requires commitment. Um, and the reason it requires commitment is that over the first two years, you have to have $25,000 in business, or you may be subject to getting kicked off of a GSA schedule contract and having wasted all that effort. We have found that uh, Companies that don't put in the time at the beginning oft at, in putting together the solicitation often find that they run into difficulty meeting that requirement. It's also something that if you have a niche product um, that only a few people might buy, um, you may have difficulty uh, getting to the $25,000 level and then continuing uh, to show sales to the government uh, in years going forward. The government wants your commitment. It wants you selling to them actively, and so you have to do that. Um, that means you have to engage in market research and targeting. You know, today is 9-11, and uh, it was a 9-11 in 2001 that the government contracting community uh, started to go through a change. No longer in Washington, where we're located today, can you just walk into a government building and go see a contracting officer? Because of COVID, of course, you're now doing it on Zoom uh, and other indirect means. But going and meeting contracting officers and users is challenging. And so getting a contract allows you to at least get in the door as an insider and gather information. And then by targeting your efforts, incrementally, you grow your business. The other aspect about once you get a scheduled contract is there are compliance aspects the most important of which is price and audits. The GSA has the authority to audit your prices over the prior three years. And as I stated before, if the GSA finds that you have in the commercial marketplace provided discounts or other more favorable terms to commercial customers that you have not reflected in your GSA sales, they can retroactively go back and claw back uh, the difference in price. The other aspect of price is when you set your price, it has to include a 0.75% uh, industrial funding fee. So uh, when you uh, sell products for a dollar, um, a little bit of that is an industrial funding fee that every quarter you have to turn over to the government and you're held to account for it. Mm -hmm. Companies get in trouble if their accounting systems are not sufficient for them to show the government auditor the IFF 
that they recovered uh, through GSA sales and that they, in fact, have turned it over to the government. Um, BAA and TAA, the Buy American Act and Trade Agreements Act, one of the nice things is because it's a commercial item contract, um, the Buy America Act um, is probably going to be inapplicable because the products are mostly sold here or they're com what are called COTS items, commercial off-the-shelf items, and therefore many of the requirements of the Buy America Act are exempted or non-applicable and you don't need to worry about them. If you are providing products from overseas, it's important that you comply with um, the Trade Agreements Act and that the products be uh, a, a, either the product of a designated country, i.e. there's a list of countries that are approved under the Trade Agreements Act, um, or that the products are substantially transformed in that country. Um, it's just something that one needs to pay attention to if components of what you are selling to the government come from overseas. Uh, generally, export restrictions don't apply to items on the GSA schedules, but if you're in the defense space or you're in the IT space, there are certain products that might be subject to the export administration regulations, so it's something that you should pay attention to if you're going to have sales that are going to go overseas. I've mentioned the audits. Um, not only are there price audits, but if the government comes back and finds three years later that you really haven't made any uh, private sector sales, they may ask you to do a cost buildup to justify why you are charging the government the prices you're charging um, in the absence of any uh, commercial comparisons. Um, that can be a bit of an effort. It costs a little bit. Um, but it is an alternative way of you satisfying your obligations to the government. Um, you, of course, can change your prices uh, periodically, not on a whim, but basically uh, annually there is often a way for you in your pricing proposal to put in price escalation clauses. Um, the government gives you a couple of formula for you to do it. This particularly applies with services when you want to increase them or whether and when there are certain services that are subject to the Service Contract Act and you need to adjust them uh, periodically. There is a mechanism for you to add new products, and I should have said new products and services. Um, you can add them uh, pretty much any time. Uh, you have to justify it, um, but you go through an addition process and you can do that. It's a little more difficult to remove products, but sometimes people do and you can notify the government that you've gotten out of a particular line of business um, to do that. It's also a little bit difficult to get out of a GSA schedule contract. Um, these contracts are awarded on a 20-year basis based on a five-year base period and then three successive five-year uh, option periods. So uh, you're, you're there for the long term, and uh, uh, it's a little bit difficult to unwind. Um, it is an asset that, in theory, can be sold to another company um, with GSA approval, um, but it's something that you should plan on a, a long-term affiliation with the government. I've mentioned teaming, the CTA teaming agreements, um, which are, I think, one of the really uh, uh, great ways for a company to expand uh, its offering to the government. This is in addition to the traditional teaming agreements that one does. CTA teaming agreements are, uh, are really uh, an excellent uh, method that a number of companies have, uh, have used. And with that, uh, my, uh, my time is up, and I thank you for spending part of your early afternoon on a Friday uh, with me. And with that, I turn the program back to uh, Jennifer Schaus and her team. Thank you, Tony, for a great presentation. And to our audience members, we thank you again for participating with us. If you have questions about this part, please contact our speaker with the contact information seen in your screen. Uh, and if you have any questions about federal contracting or need assistance with any of our services, please contact us directly. Thank you again for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.